Welcome to Rust Belt Abolition Radio. My name is Cape Syed. In this special bonus episode, we present a conversation between True Leap Press and Lorenzo Irvin and Jonina Abron Irvin, recorded in Chicago earlier last month. Lorenzo Cambo Irvin is an anarchist writer, organizer, and former political prisoner who came up through the Black Panther Party in the 1960s. Among other works, he's the author of the pamphlet Anarchism and the Black Revolution, which introduces the principles of class struggle anarchism and discusses its relevance to the black liberation struggle. Jonina Abron Irvin is a journalist, retired educator, and a former member of the Detroit chapter of the Black Panther Party. As a writer, teacher, and organizer, she has helped organize numerous efforts over the course of decades, including the anti-apartheid movement and campaigns against police terror. She's the author of the book Driven by Movement, Activists of the Black Power Era. In this timely interview, Lorenzo and Jonina discuss the current anti-fascist movement, its limitations, and how it could evolve to challenge the carceral state, white supremacy, and capitalist exploitation more explicitly. What is fascism, and how is it misunderstood by so many people who call themselves leftists and radicals today? Well, people respond to fascism in a number of different ways. One is to say that uh, fascism is a mass revolutionary anti-democratic movement. Um, that's part of fascism. That you, you know that you have these uh, uh, undemocratic forces in the streets, many of which are paramilitary. Uh, then there's another type of uh, definition, and this is the uh, the definition of the creation of a new form of authoritarian governance directly by corporations or, or corporations united with the state. And the whole idea of corporate state, which uh, was the definition given by Mussolini himself, uh, was actually was actually uh, the definition of fascist syndicalism, the idea of uniting the, the workers with corporations, you know, under the control of of the owners of, of the uh, corporations. Uh, but there's the issue of all power to the state and the leader, the idea of the, the, the leader, uh, the, the, you know, der Fuhrer in Germany or Il Duce in, in uh, uh, Italy. So that's part of it as well. So there is no one definition. There's a, and it depends on the country. One is the, the form of governance that's already in place in the country. The uh, you know the, the whole idea that a dictatorial leader sh- leader can take over a country that had previously been a so-called a democratic regime, um, and of course we're talking also about the economic form of fascism. So we've got a number of different aspects of fascism that doesn't lend us to say, oh, here's the universal. The universal uh, definition. Um, a lot of times, people point to, you know, aspects of fascism like uh, hypernationalism, corporatism, uh, leadership and party dictatorship, imperialist wars, and racism. Well, the thing is, many countries have these features, and they're not fascist regimes. Every authoritarian regime is not a fascist regime. Um, in point of fact, it, it relates to the form of state and it relates to the, the economic structure. Um, that's why I said we're talking about uh, a new type of authoritarian governance by corporations. Now, this is what, I'm, what we need to understand in America, that this is not the same thing that we saw in Italy. It's a different kind of form. Uh, the fascists have been elected. Fascists and crypto fascists have been elected, and a uh, and the um, the government we have now is actually a united front of different fascist tendencies. You know, the Tea Party, the Christian Right, the um, various other groups within the Republican group within the Republican Party and outside the Republican Party, along with elements that are on Wall Street. Financing them, so fascism is is a complicated, tortured process 
definition, you know. But we know what it's not. It's not just a bunch of street punks uh, alone who have no um, political power and that somehow they are the um, most dangerous element which produces fascism. That's what's captivated the left at this point. You know, the, the whole idea of battling uh, right-wing tendencies in the streets. And so they, they are confused. But not only are they confused, they're being led by um, a type of um, romanticism and uh, infantile leftism that uh, prevents them from being effective. Uh, there are really dangerous types of fascism that the state is capable of. And it's the state that we have to fear. You know, whether it's led by Donald Trump or whomever, whoever it's led by. Uh, the state has been doing things to ensure that whenever the dictator got here as the final solution, he'd have an easy time getting in and doing what he needs to do, or he or she needs to do. So, uh, so from that standpoint, I think that, you know, fascism has different types of definitions, you know, wrapped into one but also different kinds of uh, contradictions. And uh, so that's why it's so elusive. But one thing we can say for sure, it comes from the state and capital. It does not come from street parks. You know, it does not come from street parks. So we're talking about a kind of vanguard versus vanguardism here. It has nothing to do with fighting fascism whatsoever, really. Uh, or fighting racism, for that matter. They're not trying to end white supremacy. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to present themselves in contrast to certain forces. You know, that um, those forces are allegedly the evil ones, and therefore, you know, they are able to project themselves as the good white folks uh, versus the, you know, the, the evil or the dangerous treacherous white folks or something like that you know it's just um, fanciful it doesn't do anything about racism whatsoever it doesn't protect people of color or communities of color it doesn't do any of that what then does a community based anti-fascist movement look like well if you're going to if it's going to be community based then it has to deal with the impact of you know the state authoritarianism on you know people's everyday lives uh, it can't be centered around um, just going out maybe on a particular day to uh, counter-demonstrate against the neo-Nazis or the Klan. And I'm not saying that that's not important. That is an important thing to do. But that is just sort of an episodic, you know, kind of an event-based thing. You have to have an ongoing thing to deal with the impact of this kind of uh, control, authoritarian control over people's lives. And you know what, in terms of you know, police police terror, uh, police repression, uh, we even have to look at the issues that have to do with people's everyday survival. Uh, you know their ability to, to you know to have a place to live, uh, their ability to be able to buy food, uh, just the kind of what what, what we call survival issues. Uh, for instance. Um, it has not necessarily begun in any really uh, major way yet, but the uh, the the neo uh, neo fascist uh, Trump regime elements have already said that you know they want to eliminate social security. Okay, I many people would say, well, social security that doesn't have anything to do with fascism. Well, you're talking about people's if people don't have the ability. If they, if, if the government, if the state prevents people from being able to have income to support themselves for their housing, for their food, clothing, other things, that is a form of, it's, that's definitely a form of state terror, you know. People have to be able to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're going to build a community-based movement, you're going to have to have a movement that's going to deal with what I call bread and butter survival issues. Everybody has to have a place to live, food, you know, clothing and shelter. 
And if you're if you're not dealing with those issues, then it's not going to be community based because people in the community, those are things that they can relate to. Uh, you know, it's it, it's it, it's it's sort of a it's not so isolated as going out to confront the Klan or the neo Nazis in a demonstration or a protest. You're talking about the everyday things that people need to do to survive. The point I'm making is that community-based has to deal with people's everyday, concrete, material needs, and it has to organize around those needs. And, you know, we have to understand that fascism is of long standing. It isn't just coming um, at a certain moment and it's here. Uh, there has been a long-term uh, crisis which uh, the fascist regime uh, has brought on. And I, I can mention to you mass imprisonment, the fact that millions of people are already in concentration camps. Uh, this thing about whether you're going to build concentration camps doesn't have to. It's already got the largest prison establishment in the world, created in world history uh, by the American uh, administration, whether it was the so-called liberal, um, uh, well, the, the so-called liberal Obama administration uh, or uh, the administration we have now. And it's been a long standing, the creation of this through the, the war on drugs, which is in itself was a program designed to create uh, uh, militarism, uh, police militarism, and, um, and and mass imprisonment. So you've had that, and then the police killings, all the police killings, these are as a result of programs that the uh, government created to create a sense of crisis. And uh, the, the use of chemical warfare, drugs as a weapon of chemical warfare, and the ability of the police to come along and supposedly suppressing it, kicking people's doors in the middle of the night, uh, shooting people on the street, all these things have been enabled by the fascist regime, the effectively a, a actual fascist regime coming into existence. So um, it's a crisis that we have to fight the government. It's the government which who who, who is the arch enemy uh, and the purveyor of fascism. If we don't understand that, and we think that the real enemy is some uh, punks uh, in 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 a three piece suits or or. Uh, uh, polo shirts and so forth and we think that they are the real enemy and they are the ones to be feared we are going in the wrong direction uh, they can be used there's no question they can be used at a later state a stage by a Trump or other fascists whoever the president is and whoever the uh, head of the so called party is they'll be able to use these forces but you know at this stage we need to understand who the real enemy is and we need a way to fight back against the conditions that they are imposing on the people. We need a, a fight back movement. We need a movement based in ordinary people, not in uh, these, these, these people who consider themselves some kind of vanguard element. Um, I reject the vanguardism of this sort or any type. And uh, really, I think that uh, it's necessary to build a broader based anti-fascist movement. So that this movement can address the, the needs of the people, and it can uh, build a movement of a new type. You know, build a movement of a new type. And if if, if anyone's going to be armed, and, and, and at that time is a fast approaching as well, it would be the, the people at large, as opposed to uh, some kind of, of vanguard tendency or or some you know hyper uh, macho tendency that's you know going out and just you know fisty cuffs in the street. Uh, Nazi uh, anti-Nazi sucker punch in the street. You know, we we need more than that. Lorenzo, you use the term progressive plantation to describe the counter-revolutionary nature of the current white-dominated progressive movement in North America. Why is it so important to understand how this regime operates? Why is it so important to expose it? I use the term to, you know, demystify and delegitimize the white left. Uh, which is really only concerned with its own uh, its own uh, issues. Uh, it's not concerned with uh, killings by the police of uh, blacks and other peoples of color. Uh, they haven't been leading any, any any movement about that, and they haven't really been joining any movements around that. Uh, we talk about mass imprisonment. You know, the large, huge numbers of black people and other peoples of color that are going into the prison system. 
there has been no movement, no mass movement against uh, mass imprisonment of black people and other people of color. Uh, we talk about um, all kinds of um, other attacks upon the communities, you know, whether it's a conscious uh, um, uh, deprivation of, of the resources needed for our communities to, to survive. Poverty, in other words, uh, austerity imposed uh, poverty. Uh, these people don't fight that either. They are strictly concerned with the macho attacks uh, on, on each other, you know, attacking a Nazi, punching him in the face, as they call it, sucker punch, and all this kind of stuff. This is all they care about. It's infantile. And, uh, you know, and I even think it's, it's ineffective anyway. But it just is a reflection of the weakness and, uh, and the paucity of a ideological understanding of these people. You know, I mean, they really are... Are, are, are just fixated on just confrontation, physical confrontation. And I'm not saying that that is, we're, neither one of us saying that that is not important. Uh, it is. But uh, it cannot be the, the totality of your program. And you've got to be able to relate to oppressed people. Blacks and other peoples of color are oppressed people. Uh, whites, at the best you can say, the, the so-called white working class, are exploited peoples. Is a, is a difference. This country was based upon slavery and was based upon uh, uh, genocide and terror that uh, empowered white people to build the United States of America. Uh, land, the land thefts of, uh, from Mexico and the Mexicano people, all of these things went into building this imperial empire. If you're not fixated on uh, an anti-imperialist movement, then you clearly are just a uh, um, you know, just a, a passing trend and uh, pretty much a, a, a white-led uh, uh, movement for, you know, ego gratification or something or other. Uh, within, the, within the white left, you know, in the United States anyway, uh, there's a certain level of, of paternalism in terms of thinking that, you know, uh, that so far as people of color and oppressed people, that, you know, some on the, on the white left, and I'm not saying all, but some on the white, white left do have a paternalistic attitude that they have to come in and sort of save the people of color, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, for some, it's kind of like a missionary type of uh, uh, attitude. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not saying it's true for all white radicals, but I have seen it in a fair number of them, this kind of a paternalistic attitude. Um, so, you know, and uh, as, as if people of color themselves do not have the strength and the uh, ability and the knowledge to be able to organize and fight themselves. Uh, it, it's always going to be important for oppressed peoples, uh, people of color, to have that autonomy, that independence. You know, we work with progressive, uh, you know, uh, white radicals, other progressive whites, maybe on the left, but uh, peoples of color who are oppressed, uh, we have the right to organize ourselves, to control our own uh, struggles, our own liberation. And we don't need uh, to have people come in and sort of tell us how to do and how to do it and what to do. We know what needs to be done. We may need help with resources and things, but we're living on whatever level every day these issues. So there's that part of it, the sort of paternalistic uh, part of it on behalf of some white radicals. And the other problem is that uh, it's really been missing to me for years is that lack of effort and seriousness of most white radicals, again, I'm not saying all, but of most white radicals in terms of dealing with racism uh, and white supremacy within the white working class. You know, who is going to go in and organize the white working class? To change them, to 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 make them into revolutionaries. Clearly, people of color, that is not our responsibility. We cannot do it. We're too busy dealing with the stuff in our own communities. It is ultimately the responsibility, the primary responsibility, of white revolutionary forces that say they're white revolutionary forces to go in and begin to transform the white working class. But too many white radicals are unwilling to do that. They only want their work to be centered among peoples of color. And this is a big part of the problem why we have not made the kind of progress that we should be making in this country. Because there's no one on a serious level, in any real intense way, 
is really try to go in and revolutionize the white working class in America. And unless we do that, we're going to ultimately fail. We're not going to be able to bring about to transform the society the way it needs to be transformed. So we are talking about a kind of um, lack of real consciousness, uh, not only about racism, but about the foundations of this country and about how this system really works. And, um, and I've always said, and I've tried to make people understand, that uh, this is a white republic that was created from slave labor, from the, from the conditions of uh, slavery as a pedestal for the creation of American capitalism. And most so-called radicals de denounce that, even though that didn't come from me, it comes from Marx, <laughs> comes from Karl Marx himself. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting. And uh, it, it, this kind of d the thinking of not understanding how this country was created and how it actually functions means that the movement will always make these kind of ideological errors where they see things from a perspective of, of, of really a white uh, bourgeois kind of petty bourgeois perspective. Uh, this will always happen uh, until they understand what's really happening. I mean, people are being killed in this country. People are being tortured in prison and all this and all they can tell us is that um, about some Nazi on the street. And um, they have to be stopped, but we, didn't mm -hmm. we need to understand that the greatest threat of fascism is state power. Fascism is a, a decayed capitalist system. And if we understand that, and you'll understand these people aren't linked to that yet, they aren't linked to the, their uh, creations of that. You know, the, that's why Trump was able to use them, use their misery, use their unemployment, so forth and so on, and uh, use their racism. And if we don't understand that, that we can't, we, you can't ideologically defeat them. So uh, we need to understand that we're having to combat the government itself, the government and the state. What are some of the first steps? You would like to see organizers in oppressed black, brown, and indigenous communities take in the process of building a mass anti-fascist movement today. What are some steps that we as listeners and learners can make toward achieving the type of movement you're imagining? Well, in, rea in actual fact, I mean, people are organizing now. It's not like they're not. I mean, you know, even though I have some differences of opinion with uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, the fact it came into existence and is organizing at this period is, is, is a, an important thing. But they need to take it to another level. We're, we're saying that the organizers have to, organizers and activists have to rethink tactically. Um, they're going to have to understand that community-based organizing, where they politically educate um, the people in their communities, is a key. We're, we're, dependent, we're telling people who are already doing this work to uh, begin to take a different approach. Uh, think about this in terms of being fascism. Uh, not just, uh, Police killings, for instance. Police killings are, in fact, fa fascism. Uh, when there's, especially when there's systematic police killings where we've had uh, essentially hundreds of thousands over the last few decades. We've had uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed, more people killed in uh, military conflicts uh, abroad by the United States. So um, we need to understand in terms of this being um, a question of confronting the state. That's what I'm saying. So the, the rethinking is, is about that. We're asking organizers to begin to rethink. We're asking organizers to understand that it's time to build a broader level of organization, not just, you know, in the street on a, with a, with a, with a one-off protest, but to reach people every day and, 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 and train them so that they can then go and tell other people and build organizations on the local level. Uh, it, it might just be block by block or whatever. We don't know. We've seen these things happen in the past, but they've been, they have not been seen in this period. Therefore, we have to adopt new tactics. That's one of the things I would say. 
other thing is to bring together these movements, these different forces. Uh, bring together the movement against police terrorism. Bring together the movement against uh, the uh, mass imprisonment. Bring together all kinds of forces, and including whatever's happening in particular communities. And see, they'll differ uh, from region to region and, and, and city to city, but whatever those contradictions are, you know, whatever they're organized around, you can get some churches could be uh, used. You've got radical preachers or whatever they believe. So I think that that's important is to understand the idea of community-based organizing is to reach masses of people who you can educate and can bring into the struggle. Uh, if you've got, you know, in your whole movement, 5,000 people, well, the objective then is to bring in 50,000 and have those numbers go out in the community and reach others and politically educate them. Um, so that's what we need to do. We need to escalate uh, our level of organizing and, and understanding as well. And we need to learn from movements in the past, like the Black Panther Party, which practiced and created a whole movement of and black anti-fascism or black-led anti-fascism, uh, the actual conditions and the um, poverty of the masses of people requires us to organize uh, movements for food and housing, uh, movements for against imprisonment and, and the communities where so many had gone into prison create programs to unite, reunite them, to give them transportation and so forth. These are the kind of programs we need to think about in this period, but on a broader scale. <coughs> I even think we need to think about um, a um, poor people's survival movement or survival economy, you know, if you want to call it that. Um, and this is also something that Comrade George talked about. You know, he in, a, in a Blood in My Eye, he talked about building these kind of um, environments within a city that uh, would feed people, would politically educate people, and so forth. And he was, of course, basing that on the history of the Black Panther Party, and he, he saw it in a longer-term kind of thing, you know, and as a, uh, the creation of a resistance economy and a resistance uh, movement that wasn't just resistance in terms of armed self-defense, but uh, people were able to be fed, housed, clothed, and uh, given jobs. You know, those things that keep human beings going, you know, as well as their own organizers. Yeah, and one of the things that, that really has to be done, especially right now, is we have to begin to fight against this whole notion that we can use electoral politics. Uh, people... Uh, if we're going to build, you know, uh, re revolutionary organizers, create revolutionary community organizing, it's going to have to reject that whole notion. Right. And that's going to be a big battle because a lot of people are going to be saying, well, you have to vote. Uh, well, you know, you don't have to vote if the people who are running for office are not going to change the conditions in your, in your community. Why do you have to vote for them? You do not have to vote for them, you know. You can maybe begin in your own community to have your own community elections where you choose people within your own community outside of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, to be accountable to the people, to deal with the issues in your community. But I see this as being a really key thing because there's too much focus on that right now. Until we get past it, we're not going to be successful. So we need to create uh, alternatives. We need to create people's assemblies that are independent and autonomous of all this garbage. And uh, by doing this, we can reach people and uh, educate, organize, and uh, put them in opposition to the government and the state. We should be fighting for dual power. We need to build a mass movement for free political prisons, in mass imprisonment, and uh, especially among communities of color, combat state violence by police and vigilantes, fight austerity, and poverty imposed by the government, defeat fascists in the streets and in the government and corporate suites, build survival campaigns that begin to build a new economy and soften the blow 
of the collapse of this system, which is coming, we need to build a black partisan slash workers militia. I'm not saying it will be done tomorrow, and it should be done tomorrow, but it needs to be understood that we need to do that if we're going to go from uh, oppression to liberation. But the main thing you can say is that we have to build an anti-fascist movement that has to be a movement fighting for revolution, social revolution. If it's not ready to do that, it is just a defensive organization, which will be defeated in due time. Thanks for tuning in to this bonus episode of Rust Belt Abolition Radio. You can listen to past episodes on our website at www.rustbeltradio.org. The show is co-produced by the Rust Belt Abolition Radio crew, A. Maria, Cape Syed, and Alejo Stark, and recorded by True Leap Press. Original music by Bad Infinity.